Hi everyone, welcome. So today I'm gonna to give you a nice deep dive into design systems and I'll try to achieve peace between devs and designers, if that's possible. So my name is Mitchell. I'm a senior software engineer at YLD. So on the one hand, it'll be a bit biased towards engineers. So please forgive me for that. So let's start off by actually thinking about design systems on the side. So to begin with, we have two archetypes, and this is a very huge generalization. So don't take this to heart. Don't be offended by it. But we're going to look at it from a perspective of a designer and developer. Those are the ones that are most going to use a design system. That's what we build a design system for. So we have, on the one hand, we have designers. And we can you know, generalize them to say that they're artistic. They're feeling. They, they're creating something out of nothing. They're creating something beautiful. The idea is your user's going to use it, and they're going to look at it, and they're going to understand it, and it's going to look nice. And that's actually quite hard to achieve. And you need a certain type of personality to achieve that, in my opinion. My opinion. What the other thing that they do is that they're actually testing the unknown. So a lot of times, they'll have multiple different designs. They won't know which one's going to be the correct one. And so it's important for them to iterate and to try out all the different things that they've got going on in their mind. And only when they test it against somebody else do they actually perceive. And then on the other hand, we have developers who are more logical, more structured. Now, that just comes from the job. When you're thinking of code, you're thinking of where pieces go, how to structure things so other people can use them. I'll step back a bit. And they're very pragmatic, so they're very much trying to achieve something in a short space of time with lots of deadlines. And I've prefaced the last bullet point here as lazy. So a lot of times, developers are called lazy and for valid reasons, which we'll go into. So. Are developers actually lazy? Not really. My experience, again, experience, you're making hundreds of small decisions every day. So, you know, the less decisions you make, the less mental fatigue you'll get. And developers, what they want more than anything is to just lead a nice, easy life. So <laughs> the motto is, for most developers, is work smarter, not harder you know, achieve efficiency very quickly. So automate what you can, you know, focus on the bigger picture and do the cool stuff instead of having to like decide on like, oh, is this button the right corner radius or that? They, they, they're more, they care about more how things are structured. And again, they're very structured. So <laughs> me, myself, and I'm sure other developers, we like to structure how things work because otherwise getting to a solution is almost impossible. And day to day, you're in the zone, you're coding, and breaking out of that flow really, really hurts you, really reduces your productivity. So let's begin and actually start, try to achieve peace. So thinking about design systems, this is a philosophical question that we'll try to answer by the end of this talk. What makes a design system good? Individually great components? or the absence of components that cause pain. Now, I've worded that very specifically. You'll see why by the end of this. So why do we make design systems? Well, I'm going to say the real reason is for the developer. Controversial, I know. <laughs> but three key things that you want to do to achieve a nice developer experience and to make it really good for them is to reduce all friction, make it as smooth as possible, you don't have to reduce. You don't, you don't want to be wasting time. You don't want to be aggravated. You don't want to lose that focus as you're working. You want your work to look good as well. So you don't want it to look poor. And so making sh a lot of developers are very perfectionist. So the, the less friction, the better you can, you can get it. And obviously, that also leads to bad relationships between dev and design. The more friction there is, the more that relationship will mellow. <laughs> and that's not what you want. 
the second key thing is you want clarity. Understanding the why and how is actually very important for a developer. I think a lot of people miss that, that the developer wants experience to be really good. They want to know why they're doing something. If they're just doing it for the sake of doing it, you should just get a machine to do it for you, which obviously a lot of people see developers as machines, but they're not. <laughs> and you want to avoid repeating questions. I can, there have been countless times where I've had to ask the same thing over and over again when a simple comment would have been enough to explain why or how something should look or feel. And less communication, again, you know, if something is clear, you communicate less. You can dedicate your work more to the things that matter more to you. And the third key thing that I would say for a really great experience is having already made components making it so you're not having to remake the same decision every single time, and you can make the designs really work for you. And if anything has to be custom, which inevitably you do end up having to make things custom, but you can make it so that only the things that are really hard are the things that have to be custom. A lot of times things can be very easy, so don't make it harder for the developer by having to reinvent the wheel every time. So what causes friction? So I mentioned a bit about it, well, going a bit deeper into it. So a lot of times what you'll find is asking the same questions, and a lot of times if it means that a developer is asking you how does something flow, it means that the end user is also going to struggle to understand because your developer is the first person who will ever see your designs, who will ever actually work with the application. So if they're asking questions, it means it's not very clear and that will help you get things done well in the, in the long run. Inconsistencies. So one thing that's very frustrating for developers is seeing this. Seeing a button on one page, then seeing a button, maybe even on the same page, just slightly different. So the corner radius and the color is different, and you're asking yourself, why? <laughs> and it happens. So uh, the next thing that causes friction is not understanding. A lack of understanding of why and how, you know, it goes a long way into making sure that the developer has a good experience. And, you know, having lots of small decisions, I mentioned before about lots of hundreds of decisions a day, the more you can reduce that, the better it is. So what can we do? Well, I strongly advise a style guide. So a style guide is a way of documenting the how and why, the feel of the system. And you don't want it to be just a component library. That's not what you should want your style guide to be. You want it to be focusing on the why. What are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to make your user feel secure? Are you trying to make them feel safe, calm, depending on, obviously, the business case? Um, and you want to make it very, very easily accessible. So that's a very important point. You should be able to search it. You should be able to find it very easily. So it should be something which you can go to immediately. And it should be a reference point which is updated constantly. So it's not something which should just be written and then forgotten about. And in the end, what it should really be is a contract between your designer and your developer. And I stress this very, very strongly. It should be less than five minutes to read. That's very important because I'll explain a bit later why. So, right, we want to create reusable components. And what you want to be doing is actually making sure that they're atomic. So that's what I recommend, making them atomic, reusable, and breaking them down to the very, very specifics. So this includes things like shadows, corner, corner, corner radiuses, gradients, animations. Make it so that they're reusable. It's a really nice experience for everybody. You have a new developer onboarding. They can immediately find what they need to find and use them straight away. And for both developers and designers, the ability to import the UL library into your project and use it with simplicity. What I mean by this is, allow your tools to work for you. And to go on about reusable components, because they're very, very important, 
is I would recommend using atomic design. So that means literally breaking it down into small components and build up from the ground up. That means that your changes propagate and it's easy to use. If you're using React, I recommend using style components with style system. That enables you to achieve a lot of these goals very easily. And it puts the style choice directly on the components. Some libraries do it differently. Obviously, it's up for choice. That's a personal opinion of mine. And you want to be able to architect it in a way that the changes are easily documentable. You want to use semantic versioning. So that means you know, if you're making breaking changes, communicate that. If somebody is using that library, they need to be sure that that's communicated. And a very important thing is to leave comments. That's both for designers and developers. So communication is absolutely key. So you want to be explaining your intents, attaching those links to your, to your designs in the, ticket, in the tickets that you create. That's super helpful. You know, as a developer, you go onto a ticket, you can see it. And it's also very important to, to have those designs up to date. So you don't want the developer working off all designs, which has happened to me in the past. So it's very important. And so what it allows you to do is, if anything deviates from normality, you want to be able to leave comments so that it's obvious and you can see what's happening. That's when you get to a very custom stage. And this is quite important. If you're designing a design system, make sure you think of the edge cases. So this includes, if you're making a text box, think about overflow. If you're thinking about a picture, think about what happens if the URL is not available or it degrades for any reason. You want to make sure you think about what happens in those instances. And if you take away those, those decisions away from the developer, the better it is. And you want to be thinking about the happy path and the sad path. A lot of times, people focus on one or the other and completely neglect the other side. So now, what's the real hero of a design system? It's the, develop, the design experience. So three key things to make it an absolute smash. It's to be able to iterate really fast. So as a designer, you want to be making multiple designs. You might want to test things out. And you want to make sure your tools are working for you. You want to be communicating less. You can focus more on your work. It's kind of the same thing for a developer. You want to be focusing more on your work, doing the cool stuff. And number three is you want to be using tools that you love. In the past, it used to be where your tools would really work against you. And it'd be really hard to get designs up. And it would take time. You'd have to make one. And then you have to make another one. And sometimes you'd have to start from scratch. Now, if you use like reusable components, you can make it so you can really iterate fast and change things. And, test them, which will inevitably help your user. So again, one way of doing this is by building a component library. And you want to break it down to the very fundamentals, I would say. And you want to make it in a way that you can communicate it to developers nice and easy. Make sure it's a common language. Um, it's so nice when a designer says to you, oh, can you make that a large text? And you know exactly, you change it on the system, and it's large, and it's exactly as they intended it to be. The, the, pic, the pixel size is exactly as you intended it and as they intended it. So you want to make sure that common language is there. And being able to reuse it, again, it's a no-brainer. You want to be able to use it across all your designs. And it will reduce the decision-making in your part as well. And so for the style guide, this is from the designer's point of view. You want to make sure your intention is clear. You want to think of it as how would a developer look through it and think. So you need to actually think in their shoes, which is quite hard. You're going to have to think logically. You're going to have to structure it in a way which might not be how you would expect to think, because the developer thinks in a different way. So it's important to collaborate with the developer when creating a style guide and you want to keep it short. You want to use less words, and you can be visual, and visual actually really helps because the intent comes across very much clearer.
So at the end of all this, my goal here was to tell you what can you actually do, what can you take home, and how can you make things better for your own work environment. So things to collaborate on. You start off with, so if you have one or a design system already, obviously it's quite irrelevant, but it would help you as well. You should create a style guide. The designer creates it. So they're the ones that have the intent and the feel, and they'll know how, to, how they want things to present. And then the developer uses, uh, has a look at it and actually confirms it's usable. You want to make sure that both are happy with it. And then this is something I really like to do. On the first day of the job, it's the first thing that you hand to a designer and developer. Both of them can get on the same page, and they will remember it, because it will be one of the first things that they, they get taught of how to use it, the design system. And you want to make sure that you know, the components are atomic. I recommend Figma components and Storybook components. I recently learned about this tool on Figma, and you could essentially export the theme and make it a single source of truth. That's a really nice idea. And you want to make it so it's collaborative and you can easily you want to be setting up a communication layer. So that includes, uh, if you're using Slack or any kind of internal messaging system, have two channels. One channel is for updates on the design system. Only that. You don't want it polluted with anything else, no questions, nothing. On the other one, that's where you ask your questions, that's where you discuss things, that's where people can look and see what's coming up. And obviously, this is harder to implement but it's very useful, is to have change logs, so both for designers and developers, to see what's being changed and to version it so you can actually figure out why is it not working, why isn't it looking the way I expect it to look. Now for developers. So again, align the design tools with your base foundation. So create the component libraries and then check to make sure that they actually match. So again, if you had this single source of truth, that'd be amazing. But if you don't, go and check, make sure you're aligned, and make sure that it's exactly as you expect it to be. Use semantic versioning. Again, that's very helpful as you iterate, as things change. It's useful to be able to look back in history and see why things have changed and see it very clearly. And this is very specific. If you're working with micro front ends, package it up have it as its own micro front end and make sure that people can use it and have access to it in a way that is very much versioned and easy to use. There, in that kind of environment, it's very important to have a good communication. And now for designers, what can you do? Um, again, attach your links in tickets because otherwise you'll have the developer looking throughout all your designs and they might pick the wrong design. That has happened in the past. You don't want that. I would strongly recommend attending planning meetings. That's a very good point for developers to ask questions and actually gauge what your intention and your reasoning behind these designs was for. And you want to make sure that your tools work for you. As I said before, you know, make sure those changes propagate throughout all the designs and then you can easily see it, and you know it's nice. And so the final point that I made was, what makes the design system good? Is it individually great components, or the absence of components that cause pain? Well, my opinion, and I think hopefully you all agree, it's of the absence of components that cause pain. The amount of times that you'll use a component and it causes pain, is very high. So the more you reduce that, the better experience for everybody. So what you really want to be doing is having good collaboration, good communication, and a good foundation of reusable components. That's what makes a good design system. And hopefully with that, we can achieve peace. Thank you very much.